Okay, we're in Colossians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. We've already studied down through um, about verse 7. Uh, we might come back and read from verse 6 down to verse 10 to catch uh, the context. We're, we're talking about um, Paul's encouragement to the church to continue in Christ's teaching. Uh, teaching which they had received originally from Epaphras and then uh, through communication with, with Paul here and perhaps others who were teaching from Ephesus, and to not be taken captive by false teachers and false doctrines. Uh, in, in our world, there's always somebody trying to trick us. Something that uh, appears to be genuine may turn out to be false. Uh, and I remember when I was teaching high school, some of my students um, thought they could trick me. It's, it's very simple. English is my native language. If you don't speak English, I know. <laughs> but they still tried to trick me. And one time I was watching one of the students there, and he had a whole bunch of pens like this. And he was taking little pieces of paper, and he was taping them on the pens. And of course, I looked down and I saw that there were words written on there, but also there were equations. Uh, and I said to him, are you getting ready for a physics test? Uh, because he, he had been chosen as their favorite student in their class. There used to be a website where you could nominate person, a person as your favorite. I don't know if it's still there, but they nominated him. And I always wondered why. And they, said, they just said, oh, because he helps us. What he did is he studied, and he was clever. And then he made cheat sheets for all of them. Uh, and he helped them all to pass their exams. And they thought because I was so old that they could do that right in front of me, and I wouldn't notice it. <laughs> and I just thought, OK, I'm old, which means I wasn't born yesterday. Uh, <laughs> I can pick up on some of these things. We're going to look at uh, an example of getting old towards the end of our lesson. But right here uh, in Colossians chapter 2, remind yourself as we go through this of the, of the emphasis Paul makes on what we can do in order to be prepared for false teachers and false doctrines. So in chapter 2, verse 6, Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed, overflowing with gratitude. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of man, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. For in him all the fullness of de deity dwells in bodily form, and in him you have been made complete in his head over all rule and authority. Chapter 2, uh, we are uh, in, in, seeing in the letter to the Colossians that the Apostle Paul is dealing with uh, what appears in his mind, based on what he's understood, a real emergency in the church in Colossae. He's warning them that there is impending danger facing them. Something is coming. And so beginning in verse Six, he exhorts them. These were not suggestions, as we looked at last week, but uh, these are radical steps of action that he wanted them to take in order to survive the crisis that he sees coming to them. Paul writes, Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. And last week we talked about the word walk. Uh, walk represents what? Yeah, how you conduct yourself, your way of life. That's a typical expression you'll find in the Bible, and, and we probably use it too, uh, maybe not as commonly as they did. And so he wants them to walk in Christ. Uh, they received Jesus Christ when? When they were baptized. And so um, I'm so fortunate in the nice weather. I, I'm getting allergies. Um, hopefully um, it's just here. <laughs> they won't be anywhere else. I think I'm allergic to these trees. Anyway, <laughs> you know, stumps, trees, whatever. It's, they, don't, they have some common roots, but they don't always get along. Uh, okay. Um, 
he wants them to be prepared for the crisis that's coming. Uh, and he, he writes uh, that as they had received Christ Jesus, so walk in him. So they were united with Christ in baptism. And he wants them to realize that this is a continuing activity for them. Uh, they not only began, but they, that they need to continue. And he suggests that uh, in stating this, that the opposite can happen. It's possible that people can stop walking with the Lord. Uh, and we've, we've seen this uh, in our own lives. We see it even in the scriptures. And Paul is concerned that they uh, be aware of this particular problem as well. We can turn our hearts away to distractions that will direct us from God. And as a Christian, we need to keep moving spiritually. We need to keep uh, advancing towards him in his direction to be like him. So he gives them this beginning exhortation, and then he gives them an explanation. Paul uh, says, in order to keep walking in the way that he's talking about it, he says, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed, and overflowing with gratitude. Uh, Paul, being a, a Hebrew uh, and not a Greek, Greek, he thought in more concrete images, not uh, strictly abstract ideas as you might find in other places. And so he used very practical, well-known uh, metaphors to describe what they needed in order to survive this crisis. First of all, he says, be rooted. What is that talking about? What would be rooted mean as a metaphor? Okay. <laughs> what was your addition, Bill? Be firm. Be firm. Okay, stable, uh, someone said. Like a tree, all right? The second one he, metaphor he uses, be built up in him. Here he's talking about a construction project. Uh, we are to be built up in him. What does he mean by that? Be built up in him. Yes. It's not passive. When you see a building, it didn't just pop up there. Something happened. Somebody was involved. Someone was persistent, and someone uh, put in the effort to be involved in the construction of that building. So the metaphor talks about continual development, because these are all uh, active verbs. Uh, it speaks of progress in our walk with Jesus. We're not just passively walking. Uh, but we are actively seeking continual development. The third metaphor he used, he said in the New American Standard, be established. In the NIV, be strengthened. It's a, a metaphor of a contract. Probably wouldn't be so obvious to us uh, if someone who understands the Greek hadn't explained it. The faith here refers to what? When he says, um, be established in the faith or strengthened in the faith. What's he talking about? Christ. The faith. Whatever is the foundation of being in Christ. Yes? Yes, the idea of, in using this word uh, talks about, uh, in many places, we are in Christ. And as you were reading in, in Ephesians chapter 1, all spiritual blessings are where? in Christ. So we need to be in him. If we're going to, uh, to be established and strengthened, that's where we're going to have to be. Jimmy? Christ is the one who is uh, helping us uh, be built into this structure. We know a number of things in this metaphor. He's the chief cornerstone, right? Uh, he's that stone depending on how you translate it, that was over the arch that the others needed in order to stay in place. And, and so he is the one who brings us together and keeps us there, adds us to this house or this building as a stone, as a block, as a part. We contribute, according to Paul, uh, to the building up of the body by what? How do we contribute to the building up of the body? Everybody brings a brick to church? By encouraging one another? That's the gift of encouragement, okay? Those are gifts come from where? Back to what Jimmy said, the Holy Spirit is involved in this. He's given us gifts, and those gifts that come together help us to build the, the body of Christ. Uh, th this is also from uh, Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Uh, and in this particular case, uh, he wants them to know that their faith was based on a person, it's not based on a doctrine. It's not based 
on a thing or an object, you know, there are many religious groups have some kind of relic that they consider holy and it's essential uh, to, to their worship. Uh, but we're, we're people of a person. We have faith in a person. So we're established in a faith that's based on who Jesus is. So uh, he's teaching us here in all of this that we, um, in our effort uh, and preparation to, to keep our faith uh, intact, uh, that we need to be daily uh, being strengthened. You remember 1 Timothy, we looked at chapter 2, verse 18 and 19. He talked about the possibility of being shipwrecked in our faith. Uh, and so when people uh, have faith in Christ, they may not at the beginning of that journey ever consider the possibility that that faith, which seems so vibrant to them, could be shipwrecked or that they could lose that faith. Uh, and perhaps that was the case in Colossae, because all they're doing is adding a little whip, whipped cream to the doctrine that they've already received, right? Just adding a little bit of uh, flavor to, to spice it up a little bit. Uh, and, and, and Paul is saying, uh-uh, the faith, Jesus Christ, he's everything. He's the fullness of God. You need nothing else. So be established in him. And then he ends this metaphor, and in order to be able to resist the temptation and the influence of false teachers, he says, be overflowing with grat gratitude. Uh, in our walk with Jesus, be grateful. How is that preparation uh, our strength against false teachers? It talks about your mind. You're, if you're always thankful, you're thinking positively about God and what he's doing, JP? We're taking on the attitude, the persona of Christ. It's also in Philippians chapter 2, where we're able to see in life joy, even in those situations that are difficult. We can say, thank you, Father, even if it seems a bit painful. Leslie? Yes, if you're thankful, uh, it's not somebody whispering in your ear, that tree over there really has tasty fruit. Uh, <laughs> you know, th this idea of being thankful helps us prepare against the influence of Satan to try and draw us away. Um, a believer who's continually thankful to Christ and expresses that thanksgiving, whether in song or prayer or verbal praise, has a changed attitude and is not likely uh, to depart from the faith when put to a test. So this is what we're, we're looking at here. Um, in, in, in our challenge, as I mentioned last week, is sometimes to stop and ask, what has Jesus done for you that you're thankful for? Yes, Jimmy? Yes, the idea here is that we come back, primarily in this immediate context, to who Christ is and the word that he's given us, because it is objective. And it will help us uh, to, to work out our decisions and our priorities. Um, anything that takes us away uh, from the, the power and the fullness uh, of Christ to save us is a distraction from Satan because there's no other way except through Christ. It, it, it doesn't matter how nice or how uh, cool a person is that's talking to you. If they suggest that you do something that takes uh, Christ away from the preeminent place in your life, you need to move on. And you maybe need to move on quickly um, because the, Christ is the preeminent one. That's one of the things that is so clear in Colossians. And, and he's the one we come to. His word, he is the word. Uh, as he's given it through the Holy Spirit to the apostles and prophets, it guides us. So he doesn't want the church uh, in Colossae to be taken captive. And so he warns them, watch out. Here's some red flags. Pay attention to this. He says, uh, philosophy and empty deception. It may sound intellectual, but be careful. Yes? Those are two important things. Now, that word fullness was very important to the Gnostics. You, you were less than they were. You weren't full. You didn't have the fullness. So. Yes, and neither was Christ. This is the key thing. Uh, and so uh, Paul responds to that by saying just the opposite and how he was uh, the fullness. And so this, isn't, it, this is true. He's looking... These are centers of philosophy, 
uh, Colossae was, and also Ephesus had some of that too, because they were close together. But this is not unusual in our day and age. Uh, you know, you, you have to be careful when you go away to school because um, they want you to take all their philosophy classes where they can change your views on things. Uh, it used to be I didn't think that was their strategy. But after observing for a few years, I think, no, this is intentional. Uh, and unfortunately, it has moved down to first grade. It's not, it's not just at university anymore. So uh, we need to be wary of that. We need to be careful because anything that distracts from the preeminence of Christ is not going to help us, all right? Uh, what I would like to do then is uh, take a look at an example of what it means to walk uh, in God or in Christ. If my students asked me one time on, on Tuesday, um, was Solomon really the wisest man? What would you say to that? Yeah, how do we know that he was the wisest man? Yes, so look at uh, Second Chronicles. Let's take a look at a few verses here. Second Chronicles. Uh, and I've been, this is where actually I've been reading recently in my uh, daily reading. Second uh, Chronicles chapter 1, uh, verse 8. A few verses here. Solomon uh, uh, is talking to God, okay? And Solomon said to God, You have dealt with my father David with great loving kindness and have made me king in his place. Now, O Lord God, um, your promise to my father David is fulfilled, for you have made me king over a people as numerous as the dust of the earth. Give me now wisdom and knowledge uh, that I may go out and come in before this people. For who can rule this great people of yours? God said to Solomon, because you had this in mind, and you did not ask for riches, wealth, or honor, or the, or the life of those who hate you, nor have you even asked for long life, but you have asked for yourself wisdom and knowledge that you may rule my people um, over whom I have made you king. Wisdom and knowledge have been granted to you, and I will give you riches and wealth and honor, such as none of the kings who were before you has possessed, nor those who will come after you. So Solomon went from the, the high place, which was at Gibeon, uh, from the tent of the meeting to Jerusalem, and he reigned over Israel. So Solomon asked for wisdom. For what purpose? To rule the, the nation, to rule Israel, to rule God's people, okay? Um, this was a challenge, and he saw that it would be a challenge. Now, uh, in Second uh, Chronicles, jump down to or over to uh, chapter 9. Chapter 9. And look at verse 22 and 23 uh, in order to see how God worked this out. So King Solomon became greater than all the kings of the earth in riches and in wisdom. And all the kings of the earth were seeking the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put in his heart. They not only knew he was the wisest man, they knew why. They knew that God had put that wisdom in here. So he asked, God says, it's yours. And, and the, the people of the world around there recognized what God had done. Now turn to 1 Kings chapter 11. 1 Kings chapter 11. First Kings chapter 11. This is where I get to the story about being older. Solomon is older. We assume what goes with being older? Losing your faculties. What else? Dementia. Very optimistic. What else? Wisdom. Yeah. Now, the reality is all these other things happen, uh, and maybe we ignore it a little bit, but he's already been granted wisdom, right? Uh, so uh, you might have expected with experience and time that that would have broadened in some way. But listen to what um, 1 Kings chapter 11 says about Solomon. Now, King Solomon loved many foreign women along with the 
the daughter of Pharaoh. Uh, the foreign women included uh, from Moabite, uh, of a Moabite, Ammonite, Ed Edomite, Sidonian, uh, and a Hittite woman. From the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the sons of Israel, you shall not associate with them, nor shall they associate with you, for they will surely turn your heart away from their gods. Solomon held fast to these in love. He had 700 wives, or princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned his heart away. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart away to other gods, and his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of, uh, of David his father had been. For Solomon went after the Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the detestable idol of the Ammonites. Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not follow the Lord fully, as David his father had done. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the detestable idol of Moab on the mountain, which was east of Jerusalem, and for Molech, the detestable idol of the sons of Ammon. Thus also he did for all his foreign wives who burned incense and sacrificed to their gods. Okay, let's talk about this just a little bit. Uh, Solomon was clearly wise because God had given him wisdom. But according to this chapter, verses 1 and 2, what did Solomon do that hindered his walk with God? He met all those women. Okay. Uh, in, 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 the, in these two verses, what key words and phrases indicate that Solomon is headed for trouble? What are, in verses 1 and 2, what, what are some key words that show that Solomon is headed for trouble? He, he loved many foreign women. Now, now, that should have sent up a red flag. Because what did God say? to the kings of Israel, before there were any kings, what did he say? Do not marry these women, and why not? They'll turn you away to their gods. Do not do it. God also said, don't go back to Egypt, buy horses and chariots. What did Solomon do? He went back to Egypt and bought horses and chariots, JP. Yes. This is a key thing we're looking at here. What distracted Solomon in these first few verses? These women distracted him, okay? Uh, the lust of the flesh. Uh, he loved many foreign wives whom the Lord said not to marry. And notice in verse 2, um, Solomon held fast to these in love. Doesn't love cover a multitude of sins? Well, that's a verse taken out of context. <laughs> okay, it can be. But, you know, the, 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 it's, it, it's 1 Peter 4, verse 8, that speaks of um, a love covers a multitude of sin, but it's a love for one another as Christians that covers a, a multitude of sins because you are being forgiving and gracious to one another. This is the challenge of walking with the Lord. What do you have to manage? Your mind. You've got to manage your mind. And what does the scripture say is the window to the mind? Your eyes. And, and if your eyes are darkness, and your ears, yeah? If your eyes are darkness, is that talking about being blind? No. It's the filter that allows darkness in and keeps the light out. So what I'm wanting us to see in Solomon, because my students said, how could he be the wisest man in the world and do what he did here in 1 Kings chapter 11? That's the question that Paul is dealing with in Colossians chapter 2. These people are just wandering along or out and shopping along the way with all the philosophers and false religions, and he's saying, you're going to get into trouble. Yes. The same question. How could David be a man after God's own heart? Yes. How could you be a man after God's own heart? There is a difference, uh, and that's one of the things that's worth talking about. We'll get to it uh, as well. But let, let's, go, let's go back and look at verse 3. How did Solomon's wives interfere uh, in his walk with God. Look at verse 3. 
He had 700 wives, oh my goodness, princesses and 300 concubines, and his wives turned his heart away. What did these women do? They turned his heart away. Away from? From God. You know, he turned his, they turned his heart away uh, from God. Now, it's, it's obvious and it's clear and it's powerful to see it here because it's so extreme. But the reality is humans are humans. And we need to be careful of what's being said here. Uh, in Deuteronomy 17, verse 17 and 18, uh, here's what God warned the kings. Neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. Also it shall be, when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book from the one before the priests, the Levites. What did God plan for the kings of Israel to help them stay on track? Yeah, now let me suggest, you, if you want to know what this was like, when you go home, get out a piece of lined paper and start copying the entire Old Testament, or at least the five books of the law, because this is what the king had to do. He couldn't hire somebody. He couldn't go buy one. The priest was there, and he had to write it down. So did he know God's word? Well, he should have. Jimmy? That's the power of it, right? But what's the condition of that word influencing him? What has to happen before this word is going to influence him from verse 19? He reads it every day. You mean to tell me the king has to take out time to read the word of God every day? You mean there aren't people when they get to a certain age that they don't need to read the word of God anymore? Maybe. We don't have a record. Isn't that a pity? We don't have a record. Maybe someone did. Maybe that young man who found the scriptures. I was going to say, wasn't there a seven-year-old? Yes. There were several young men, but one found the scriptures, and he changed the whole country, if you remember a little guy. Uh, I don't know that he was little, but uh, we think of him as a young person compared to some of these older ones. But anyway, pardon me? Oh, he was eight years old. Exactly. Yeah, he was eight years old. So what we're talking about here uh, is God has prepared at every corner wisdom, blinders, as well as vision of what we're going to experience in this world. And he tells us, watch out for this. Paul is telling the Colossians, watch out. It's not just loving one another. Uh, because they're your neighbors and they have their own God and, and you should love them even though their God is different. Well, you should if you're talking about agape, but you need to be careful, yes? Here's a challenge. Uh, God warned them about those things that would make them comfortable. Comfortable in neglecting the responsibilities they had of walking with God, including knowing his word. Uh, and so this is something that we can pay attention to. Uh, if, if, if a king, the wisest man to ever live, could make these mistakes, whoa, we need to be walking close to the Lord. We need to be paying to his word. As Jimmy said, we need to be reading it every day. Uh huh. What, so uh, what wisdom can you get from this particular scenario so far? We're down to, to verse 4. Uh, even though he is old, guess what? Being old doesn't protect you. Exactly. This is a temptation that the very point that Paul is making to the church at Colossae, you're not aware of the danger that you are in. Uh, and evidently, the king wasn't either. Uh, he should have been. He should have had his own copy. Uh, he, uh, of the word, whether he did or did, he didn't, the priests were there who could have talked to him. He had many opportunities to do exactly uh, what God had given him as guidance to avoid uh, this problem. But in verses 5 through 8, um, what have become Solomon's priorities? Look there, 5, five through 8. 
Let's read it again. And as we're reading, look for what its priorities are. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the detestable idol of the Ammonites. Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not follow the Lord fully, as David his father had done. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the detestable idol of Moab, and on the mountain which is east of Jerusalem, and for Molech, the detestable idol uh, of the sons of Ammon. Thus also he did for all his foreign wives, who burned incense and sacrificed to their gods. Uh, what were some of Solomon's priorities that we see here in verses 5 through 8? Pardon me? Pleasing his wives. Pleasing his wives. If they wanted him to go with them to worship this detestable god of the Ammonites, this Molech, do you know what they did with Molech? They burned their, sacrificed their babies to this detestable god. Uh, and so um, that's one of his priorities. What do my wives want? Can you imagine that? I'm not even married. I can't hardly imagine uh, having so many wives. And what is a concubine, by the way? It's a girlfriend. <laughs> Pardon me? Yeah, that's putting it nicely. Uh, these are distractions for him because they've changed his priority. How is his life described in the sight of God? Look at that. How is his life described in the sight of God? Evil. His life, he went all the way from an amazing person who saw he needed wisdom and asked only for that to being a, uh, in his older life, a person who's so distracted by all these women and his life has become evil. For what reason? What makes his life evil, do you suppose? All of these false gods, he's gone away from the true God. He's doing things that are not part uh, of God's will. Uh, and so it, 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 he's evil in the sight of the law. He did not uh, fully follow God as David uh, had done. This is a, a sad state of affairs, and it helps us perhaps to realize the, the danger that even uh, we can face if we're not careful uh, about our own walk uh, in Christ. Um, what is ironic in verse 7 about Solomon building houses for the gods of Moab and Ammon? What's ironic about that? He built the temple and just across, it says there, just across, he builds this, these houses to these false, detestable gods. This is how dangerous it is because we can get so far away uh, so quickly. Uh, and so in verses 9 and 10, what reason does God have to be especially angry with Solomon? Let's look down at verses 9 and 10. Now the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods. But he did not observe what the Lord commanded. What made God angry with him? He had specific directions. The interesting thing about that, uh, talking about that particular um, aspect, um, he didn't get a package from Amazon saying all these things. How did he learn them? God, God visited him twice. I mean, how often does that happen? God visited him twice. In my lifetime? Yeah. <laughs> but, but what we're looking at here is the, the extreme danger and why we can appreciate that Paul was so concerned for all of the churches. Remember he said that? All the things that he's troubled by, including a concern for all the churches, because he knows what the devil can do. Uh, he's ha had his own personal struggles. And so we find here that God is angry with him because he visited him twice uh, and commanded him concerning the very specific things 
that he was doing wrong. And God was angry. Yes. Yes, and in this passage, the turning away of his heart is the key thing. The key thing. Uh, and that's one of the things we have to watch out for is where is our heart, JP? I was going to say, as parents, we don't call it failure, but what a loss. Yeah, it is a, a sad thing, and we see it from time to time, uh, not just in families, but in the family of God. Uh, what did God speak in judgment concerning Solomon in verse 11? It says here, So the Lord said to Solomon, because you have done this, and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. So what is it that God intends to do in judgment against Solomon? So verses 12 and 13 help us to see the, the promise of God, the word of God. You know, if he tells you something, he's going to do it. If it doesn't happen, it's not because of him. Uh, and so we, we see here, as Jimmy says, that um, he could have uh, torn the kingdom away from him immediately uh, and thrown him under the bus, so to speak. But he's concerned about what? Why doesn't he destroy the kingdom of David? He made a promise. What is the promise? The Savior will come through David. Now, David wasn't perfect, we all know that, but David repented when it was presented to him, uh, which is a different story. But what, what I'm asking you to, to think about um, is what wisdom from Colossians, if practiced by Solomon, might have helped him to avoid the break in his walk with God? And how can we gain wisdom from the example of Solomon and see um, no matter how smart we are, no matter how much people uh, praise us or, or brag on us, um, there are some things that are fundamentally essential. And walking with God and not turning away from him uh, is a key thing. Uh, so Paul is, is, is telling the church in Colossae, keep walking with God. Don't allow anything to divert you from that. And make it, you know, your own by thinking about in your own life, in what, in what way, uh, in, in these steps that Solomon had, uh, am I getting close to any of them? And what can I do to turn away from that? Yes, JP? This woman you gave me. Yeah, got to blame it on yeah. somebody. Yes, the idea then is our relationships. And we can make choices, as JP said. If, if that's going to be a problem for us, we can make choice. We don't have to get married. Uh, but it can be other relationships. It doesn't have to be marriage. It can be people at work, people in the neighborhood, social acquaintances you have that are trying to pull you this way. So many people were convinced that I should be drinking alcohol in Europe because it was odd. One guy said to me, I don't trust anybody that doesn't drink beer. <laughs> and so what are they trying to do? You know, there's a reason why I don't want to drink alcohol or drink. Yeah, because in my family, there were people who were alcoholics. Uh, and as I became a Christian, I realized this is a good thing to, to give up. Uh, and so I did. But, you know, it is a little bit troubling. You have to be aware, be prepared, because they think, I think I made them uncomfortable. I didn't preach on it. When it came up in class, I said, okay? If they asked me, I said. Because beginning of many a small Bible study I had was a drink of some kind of brandy. It was this part of their culture. And I would tell them in advance, don't pour a cup for me, but it didn't matter. They always had to make a big deal. Uh, and they, they, you know, how I told you sometimes, they, they would say, well, take it for your stomach's sake. And I said, Next week I'm coming in with about a gallon-sized Pepto-Bismol, and you all can take a swig of it, okay? Uh, <laughs> for your stomach's sake. I said, it was medicine. He, he was telling them about medicine. Uh, and, you know, that's how it happens. Bill, were you going to add something else? Yeah, you need to ask the preacher sometime, um, because Solomon wrote what other books? Song of Solomon? Ecclesiastes? Wasn't Ecclesiastes written after? Proverbs. Yeah. Did he, did he repent? 
Oh, Tommy, if you've run across that, I'd like to know. Because my students asked me, and I said, I see no evidence of it. Maybe, maybe Ken does. What? Well, I was giving her a sign language. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if he repented. It appears to me he did not. And that's the meaning, you know, faith without works is dead. There has to be some consequence of your faith, some result. And so we know that. And that's the, the key thing, though, is the person. If he loved God, if we love Jesus in the sense that we're talking about love, then that will be, that will be blinders to the world to some extent. But once that love is gone, Satan can have his way. Let's have a closing prayer because the kids are wanting to come out. All right? But shall, shall we pray? Sorry. No, it's all right. Father, we are so grateful for our opportunity to study your word and to see in the lives of the, uh, of the church and uh, the people in Colossae um, wisdom for our own lives and for the teaching that Paul has given us, how we can be encouraged by that. Father, we're uh, not wanting to follow in the steps of Solomon. We, we pray, Father, that um, we'll, we'll not give up our pursuit of you and pursuit of your Son and the will that you've revealed in your word. We pray this in your Son's name. Amen. Amen.